Welcome, everyone, back to the School of Greatness podcast. We have a legend in the house, Meatloaf. Oh. Asked me to go by Meat. Good yeah, to see meat. you, sir. Okay. Good to see you. I just have to explain one thing to you. Yes. I never allow people in advertisement mm -hmm. of a record or a tour or anything use the word legend, star, or superstar. Okay. Because I don't think of myself as that. Mm. I think of myself as the same as we're looking out a window, and I'm mm -hmm. assuming somewhere down there there's a guy working on a telephone pole. Yeah. And I'm just like that guy, only I have a different job. Mm. You both work hard. Yeah. Both have a specific talent. That's right. But yours seems to look uh, more people want to listen to your talent than... Someone I don't know about is. that. When the phone goes out, they're going to get upset. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people don't want to get on that phone. That's true. Uh, well, you when have your <laughs> cell phone goes out and that tower goes down, you want to know why. That's true. <laughs> that guy is important. Well, for me, you've created some incredible music over the years, and you've been a big part of my life growing up, and your your work in movies and Broadway, It's it's really been inspiring to watch your career. So. Yeah, I've done... I've done a lot of things. You have. I have been on Broadway. I've done Shakespeare in the Park. I've done Off-Broadway. I wanted to know what stand-up comedy was like. Mm. So I did, um, the first night I did stand-up comedy, I opened for a very famous old comedian named Henny Youngman uh -huh. in the Westport Playhouse. And... Uh, I went to the guy that owned the the uh, the club. Yep. He knew who I was, and he said, "Well, have you ever done stand up before?" And I said, "No, but I, but I want to know what it's like." Uh huh. And so he said, "Okay, I'll give you four minutes." <laughs> I said, "Fine." So I didn't have anything prepared. I went up strictly improv. And it was the whole was about me meeting Elvis at the Rocky Horror Show. Hmm. And I had people in hysterical. And because uh, uh, I'm a closet comedian. Sure. And so, uh, <laughs> and Henny Youngman actually walked out of his dressing room and was standing there when I came off. Wow. Now, people who don't know who Henny Youngman, Henny Youngman is famous for saying, Take my wife, please. Mm. Um, so the next night, he said, will you do this again? I said, yeah. He said, I'll give you eight minutes. So I, did okay. this, I, I had eight. And listen, I could have gone on for 30 minutes. Really? Improv? Yeah. Wow. Well, I did a lot of improv. Mm. I, I, you know, I was when National Lampoon Show was going, they said to Belushi, you have to have an understudy who can possibly understudy you. He said, there's only one guy in this town who can understudy me, and that's Meatloaf. And so I went on a couple of times, mm -hmm. and and I worked with Gilda, and I worked with Billy Murray. And, right, wow. And so, I mean, but the king of improv is was really Richard Belzer from, from Law & Order SUV. Okay. He was my opening act when we first went out with Bat to Hell for about, oh, a good three months. Mm. And he is the king of improv. Really? I've never seen anybody better than Richard Belzer. More impressive than all the guys who uh, do Whose Line Is It Anyways, more than Saturday Night Live guys, just... Oh, yeah, and I know all those guys. Right. Who's the second most impressive? Uh, I don't know one of those guys on Who's My Line, but I can't remember his uh, name. Wayne or what's... Not Wayne. The tall guy. Bald guy, tall bald guy. Used to be on the uh, the sitcom. Not the bald guy. The, Not the bald guy. I think he's redheaded. I'm okay. colorblind. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're all funny to me. So yeah. <laughs> They're all incredible. Yeah, Wayne's great. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool. Um, what got you into music and, and acting in the first place? Why were you inspired as growing up that way? I wanted to get out of study hall in, as a sophomore in high school. You and me both. That's why I did sports, though. <laughs> I, I, I said... Uh, 
I can't sit in this room. Oh, my gosh. I have to be quiet. Oh, it's the worst. And uh, and I'll give you a clue why. We were supposed to open uh, all the uh, casinos are building arenas now. Mm. And so I think there was a 9,000-seat or 10,000-seat arena being built on a reservation in Oklahoma. Okay. And we were supposed to be the first act to play there. Well, about three days before, they came to me and said, the arena's not finished, mm. and they want to put up a tent. I said, I don't care. If the people come, that's all I care about. <laughs> sure. And so the head of the council, they don't call them chiefs anymore, uh -huh. the head of the tribal council wanted to meet me. And so he came in, and all I did was ask him questions. How do you decide this? Does everybody participate in the profits of the casino? Mm. How do you decide this? You know, I just kept asking him everything about I wanted to know how they worked. And he stopped me and he goes, do you mind if I give you an, your own name for our tribe? And I went, oh, my God, I'd be honored. Are you kidding? He goes, okay, and this tribe from now on you're known as never shuts up. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious and i i just cracked up so i tell the story all the time because i thought it was the funniest you, thing you ever. thought it'd be like walking warrior or something cool right yeah. eagle no, eye no i really <laughs> I, I think never shuts up fits me perfect <laughs> that's amazing okay so what was your first uh i guess moment or experience of either a song or music or a show that you saw that you said wow that's really cool it'd be fun to experience something like that i know the study hall was i, I and I never had that. Mm. I just have always wanted to try everything. Yeah. So I hosted game shows. Really? For VH1. Wow. For DirecTV. Mm. I've done stand-up comedy more than once. Um, well, twice there, then three other times in different clubs around New York. Mm -hmm. And I decided... This is too hard. <laughs> uh, no, there wasn't. I don't remember any one thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're just curious about all of it. Yeah, yeah. I just I I really like being in the drama class in yeah. sophomore, and I I really wanted to learn that craft in high school. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so then I tried out for the musical. My sophomore year, they gave me a small part. S junior year, they gave me a small part. Senior year, I had one of the leads. Wow. And I got voted uh, in my senior year as one of the top 10 actors, high school actors in Dallas. Hmm. And so they let us be walk-on soldiers in the, mus in the opera Carmen. Wow. which was playing, which was opening downtown. Mm -hmm. And we were soldiers. We walked on going, oh, 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 That's all we did. But the world of opera <laughs> is very interesting. Mm. Um, <clears throat> do you like opera? Do you like singing opera? Well, I'm a held in tenor. Mm -hmm. that, I had to learn how to sing rock and roll. Mm -hmm. I had to learn, literally teach myself how to sing the songs on Bad in the Hell. Mm -hmm. And if you were to listen to the new record, mm -hmm. the first verse of a song called uh, Going All the Way is Just a Start, and you listen to the verse, first verse of Bad Out of Hell, it's sung in exactly hmm. the same voice. It's just, I'm 40 years older. <laughs> so the timbre right. is a little bit different. But if you really, if people really took the time to listen mm. and not just automatically judge because, oh, and see, <laughs> if they really took the time, mm. they would go, oh, he's right. That is exactly the same voice. It's just that the tone is different. Yeah. And the reason is, is because my natural singing voice is operatic. Yes. And I'm a held in tenor. And in fact, I was doing Shakespeare in the Park in 72 for Joe Papp. And I had an offer from 
opera patrons, they would pay me $60,000 a year. And you got to figure, 1972. That's great money. $60,000 a year for five years to study with Pavarotti's coach <laughs> and make my debut at the Met. That's huge, right? That's like the dream, isn't it? Well, it was confusing. Oh. Because the most money it ever made before was $7,500 in a year. So 60 k is a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> and so, But just like everything that I've ever done, whether it be whatever it is, I have to research it. Mm -hmm. That's just who I've been. Even as a kid, when I was five years old, before I would buy a toy, like there was different army men, you know, you could sure, buy. of course. I would research mm. to see who made the best ones. Yeah. And my mom would go, did you find out yet? I went, yeah, I want that, those. <laughs> and I would research. I've always been, that's who I've been. Mm -hmm. And so I did the research. And unless you were Pavarotti or Placido Domingo or Beverly Sills, I can't remember who the major stars were in opera in 72. Right, right. But unless you were a major, major star in opera, the conductor controlled everything. He controlled your phrasing. He controlled the tempo. He controlled everything. And I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I'd be in prison for murder. Because <laughs> I would have killed him. Sure. And because I'm rebellious. You're right. And I don't like when anybody tells me how to sing anything. I, I, it, you can't tell me that. And because I've done so much research mm -hmm. on the song and uh, on this record. Where's that camera? Yeah, you can show it. Over now. there? This one's good, too. Oh, yeah. okay. This one right here. Mm -hmm. It starts with a song called Who Needs the Young? Mm. And it was written by Jim Steinman when he was 19 years old. Wow. And it was the first song we recorded, and then we went and did shows. So, and I have never, ever, and I've sung a lot of Jim Steinman songs, never asked Jimmy why he's written a song. What is it about? Why don't you ask him? I don't want to know. I'm really not interested. Hmm. Uh, it's like when I do a film. I don't want the writer to come up to me and tell me why he wrote the character. I want to discover the character myself. Hmm. Because the character, if he tells me why he wrote him, that's going to influence my decisions on so who I funny. think the character is. That's so funny. Uh, so I've never asked Jimmy, hmm. and he knows that every song that I've ever sung of his has been in a character. Mm -hmm. And it comes from acting. Mm. So people go, are you an actor or a singer? I go, I'm an actor. And I take acting into every phase of what I do. Yeah. It's like doing stand-up. It's improv. That's acting. Um, so I decided to take the first song because Jimmy wrote it when he was 19. Mm -hmm. And I didn't ask him why. All I knew is that the kid was really angry. Whoever, <laughs> or the, whoever, he could have written about an old man. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I decided that I would make my character 19 years old and very angry. Mm -hmm. I know what he was angry at, but I'm not going to tell you. Right. Because I've always said, Everybody, if they buy the album, should take a piece of white tape, <laughs> put it across my name, write your own name on the album. Because the album is then yours. Mm -hmm. It becomes your stories. It becomes what you think it is. Yeah. I don't want to tell you what I sing about. I'm not going to tell you what Jimmy wrote about because I don't know. Yeah. And the album belongs to the listener. Sure. And and we on this record did not. P 
people, when they heard Stam and I were getting back together, were anticipating hearing Batter to Hell or Batter to Hell 2. Mm-hmm. Jim and I made the decision, we're not going to repeat that. Right. We're going to make something that is just like Bat, lived in its own world and was like <laughs> nothing else in its time <laughs> and took almost 10 months more to break. Mm. You don't have that now in the music business. Right. So people are buying the record, expecting it to be like those two, and it's not. Mm-hmm. And I've read some reviews on Amazon where, oh, it's like a musical. And I'm going, (laughs) God, (laughs) people, go online and look at YouTube Mm. and find a musical and listen to how they sing in it, listen to how they're doing it. This album is absolutely nothing like a musical Mm. if you knew anything about it and if you don't before you make a comment do what i do do your research right Right. it's like there were mostly this is the first album that we have ever gotten good reviews for Hmm. i i was in a state of shock (laughs) <laughs> I mean, we got good reviews from Rolling Stone, Entertainment Weekly, Q Magazine, Kerrang. I mean, I don't. we've never gotten four and five stars. We got five stars from three or four places in Germany. We've never gotten five stars. We've never gotten four stars. Right. <laughs> I think the highest we ever got was three from somebody once. Um, but they seem to have gotten it. Mm. Um and there are these people out there that review, and I go, if you're going to be a reviewer, at least know music. Mm-hmm. Understand music. Sure. Not just, you know, uh, Public Enemy or Snoop Dogg or Dave Grohl right. and, 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 you know, uh, Britney and... Mm-hmm. And Kanye you know, or whatever, yeah. yeah, Kanye. No music. Yeah. No Mozart. No Beethoven. No Mahler. No, know who these people are, because I read one the other day where he said, "Well, the first song is like circus music." I'm going, "Oh my God!" <laughs> no, the song is based off. He was basically a pop writer. Mm in Germany named Kurt Weil in the 30s. And he basically wrote what would have been in the 30s pop music. Mm-hmm. And he always wrote it in three, four time. And the song is based off of a Kurt Weil sure, kind sure. of theme. And this guy goes, it's like circus music. I'm going, oh my God, come on, dude. If you're going to write music, learn music. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, make sure you guys go get this. Uh, Braver than we are, but put white out over the name and put your name on it. And there. also, I've got a doctor's <laughs> prescription for it. You do? Yeah, which is if you buy it, a lot of people love it on the first listen. Mm-hmm. A lot of people hate it on the first listen. My prescription is this. Buy it, listen to it four times in one day. <laughs> By the fourth time... Uh-huh. You'll get it. There you go. You'll see where the magic is. Sure. And the other thing, it's not a musical, folks. Okay. (laughs) Not anything (laughs) like a musical. Perfect. It has nothing in common with a musical whatsoever. Sure. Except for Jim and I come from the theater. Mm -hmm. And the only thing it's got in common, it's got acting in common, Mm -hmm. because Jimmy's from the theater. I'm from the theater. I'm from the acting world. Right. So I decided to backstory every character and sing him from the point, sing it from the point of view of a 19 year old. Mm. Sure. Every one of these songs. Amazing. And Train of Love, which when you listen to it, you would think, oh, it's a guy singing about a girl. It's not. It's a 19 year old 
trying to find out who he is. He mm. doesn't. He is confused. I think every 19-year-old feels that way probably, right? Everyone, well, a lot of, late. most of them. Yeah. It's like, what, you know, I'm in a crossroad. Do mm. I go left? Do I go right? Do I go back? Do I go forward? Where I've always... I've been at hundreds of crossroads. I've never even looked right or left or behind. I just go forward. Mm. And that would be my advice to anybody. You come to a crossroad, don't look left, don't look right, don't look backwards, you go forward. I've had people come to me when they're at crossroads and ask me, what do you think? And I go, do this, because it's moving you forward. Mm. I like that. Yeah. I'm curious about your sound. You have a very unique sound. Was there a moment where you were like, okay, this is my sound in your 20s, your 30s, like this meatloaf has arrived, this is the sound? Or? No. I I change sounds constantly. The It's like I'm not Robin Zander, I'm not Dave Grohl, I'm not Freddie, who is the best rock singer ever to live. Mm. other than J- male joplin was mm-hmm. period yeah but male it's freddy um joplin was in a different ball ballpark she was uh like they had the all-star game every year mm. she can she was in the all-star game every day right um <laughs> uh and so I have so many different tones mm-hmm. and qualities, hush voices, big voices, yeah. little voices. And Jimmy on this record, and it's one of the things that freak people out, they were expecting me to come in with this bombastic, you know, right, loud, high voice. But if they listen to Bat, I don't do that on Bat. Yeah. I do on the chorus, but not till we get to the chorus. Sure. And Jimmy said, no. Because I went up the octave on a song called Going All the Way is Just a Start. And Jimmy goes, no, no. Stay in your low voice. Mm. Stay in your low voice. Your low voice is remarkable. Yeah. And I've had a few critics call it wobbly. It's not wobbling, people. It's called vibrato. <laughs> yes, wow. I grew up. I grew up in a uh, musically talented family. My my parents were opera majors at Ohio State. My brother is uh, a jazz violinist. He played with Les Paul for ten years oh. at the Iridium in New York City. He played at his funeral. So I've kind of grown up um, admiring many genres of music and being able to uh, so pre- you, appreciate you would it. make a better reviewer, yes. reviewer <laughs> than that guy that went. <laughs> exactly, sounds like a circus. Exactly, I'm going. Come on, man. <laughs> if you're going to review music, at least learn sure, about it. Sure, I'm curious, who was uh, your most uh, influential person in your life growing up? Uh, well, growing up, it would have probably been uh, Big Daddy Lipscomb from the Baltimore Colts. Okay. Or Ray Nitschke, or Fuzzy Thurton for the Packers. Okay. Or... Uh, but I would say Big Danny Lipscomb, who played defensive tackle for the Baltimore Colts. Why was why was he the most influential? Because when I was a kid, I wanted to play professional football. Mm. And because uh, I was so much bigger than everybody else until my junior year in high school. And then everybody caught up. <laughs> and I was no longer the biggest one. I couldn't push people around like I could before. Mm-hmm. So... I just had to become the meanest guy on the field. Wow. So I went into acting mode. Uh-huh. And I be- developed this character that played football that was absolutely as mean as you could possibly be. What position were you? Oh, we, oh, God, the head coach. You played all over the place? Or oh, he ran a, <laughs> a he, he thought he was a college coach. He ran a defense based on LSU out of the 60s called the Chinese Bandits. Okay. Which was the most ridiculous defense to try to put into a high school. I played middle linebacker, nose guard, tackle, defensive end. When I went out to defensive end, 
that outside linebacker would rush, I would cover the flat. Uh-huh. Now, I wasn't fast forward, but laterally, I was as fast as anyone on the team. Mm. So I could cover the flat like nobody's business. Right, right. Anybody come out to the flat, that, that halfback come out to the flat, forget it. You ain't catching the ball. <laughs> and if you do, you ain't gaining any yards. Dude. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, when we were playing in, in, in practice, they didn't blow the whistle. I kept hitting. Of course. Oh, I got yelled at. I had to run laps. I go, well, blow your whistle if you want me to stop. I know. Otherwise, the, the play's still on. Yeah. Play to the whistle. That's what they teach you. Yeah. Yeah, of course. When you blow the whistle, I stop. Mm. Until you blow the whistle, I'm not stopping. Mm. And they would sometimes run first-team offense against first-team defense. Mm-hmm. And I remember one time hitting the starting quarterback. I mean, I nailed him. Oh, oh I got Oh, <laughs> I think I had to run about 10 miles for oh that one. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. And uh, <laughs> what Do you think uh, sports played a big role in your career? In terms oh, I know of- it did. I know it did in the discipline. Mm-hmm. Because when you play sports, you have to be very disciplined. Yes. And when you're an actor, you should be very disciplined and I was in the car I just I just just left Rich Eisen mm-hmm. and I was explaining I went to dinner with an actor named Charles Sterning and he said if you want to really freak a cast out go into a table reading of the of the movie without the script oh that is and if they ask you, do scary. you want a script? You go, no, I don't need one. That is, <laughs> that and is scary. So they read the whole script. And when you don't know everybody's lines, but you know when your scene's coming. So when they start that scene, you're ready. But you sit there, and he says, I got news for you. Every actor is going to freak out. And so when it comes time to do your scene, Mm -hmm. whatever actor you're working with is going to come to the set and he's going to know his lines. Mm. Yeah, he is. (laughs) And and they know you're dead serious. Mm. So that comes back to discipline. And it wasn't until Charles Durning told me that, and he told me that in like 97 maybe. Mm -hmm. So... Did you do that I, in a reading one time? or? Oh, he did it in every reading. Did you do this ever? Oh, I've done it in every reading really? I've ever done since he told me that. You show you show up, and then you're the only one without the script, and everyone else has a script. Yeah. But they're coming prepared to, to set, is what you're saying. Oh, when they come to set, they wow. know. And that's, that would be so intimidating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like the person just memorized everything? And, that's the point. Yeah, wow. I haven't memorized everything, but I've memorized... Your parts. My... And I know what the other guy's going to say. That's impressive. That's a skill right there. So, that you, you that's that's discipline. Yeah, you learn that from football and other sports. Yeah. yeah. So, and the other thing that drives me crazy on a set is when you're getting you're doing a scene with a character, and I I was doing a scene in a movie called uh, Hole in One, mm-hmm. and I'm doing it with. With a guy you see a lot on TV, uh, he does a lot of guest starring roles. Not big roles, but, uh-huh. you know, pretty good roles. And uh, we're going to do this scene, and he goes, well, my character wouldn't say this. Mm. And I said, hang on for a second. <laughs> uh, before you got here, did you read the script? And he goes, yeah. I said, Okay. In the script, does your character say that? And he goes, yeah. I said, so let's analyze this for a second. (laughs) My character says this, and it's written in the script. I'm going to say this. If you change that, what your character says, you're going to look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. And he goes... Oh, okay. 
<laughs> Have you ever changed anything or gone ad lib or improvish? Well, only without if if I'm in a movie where there is improv going they say, on. Go ahead, you know, you can extend. Yeah, the line if you're or, doing that kind of thing, if you're sure. doing a movie with Will Ferrell, right, or some of those guys, and back when Chris Farley was alive, uh-huh. or or Belushi or any of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of improv. In a, there's more improv in a comedy than there is in a drama. Right. But Richard Belzer being the best improv guy, if you were watching Law & Order SUV, I knew every time he threw in an improv. Really? Because it just didn't feel right? or it was... No, it felt perfect. Okay. But you could sense from the other actor. Oh, wait. <laughs> it, it just like, twisted him but Belzer was very smart he usually waited if he had the last line in the scene Mm -hmm. so that the other actor wasn't for he didn't force the other actor into doing something that wasn't would be thrown off and say well what am I yeah because that's called forcing yes gotcha and wow you don't ever force anything in a film do you feel like without your sports experience that you would have been as disciplined or as successful in your career as a Not a physician? prayer. Really? Not a prayer. I'm so glad you say that because I feel like as an athlete, I played professional football and I played basketball and decathlon, and uh, I feel like that's what's catapulted me into my entrepreneurial career and everything else. Was yeah, the, the hard you playing, work. You playing pro football? I played arena football in uh, Alabama. Oh, cool! Yeah, which is a, have you ever seen arena football? It's like, yeah, yeah. It's a whole other game. It's intense. And, oh, uh, it's <clears throat> really intense. I broke my wrist in the first season and, and diving into a wall, and it was just. Uh, oh yeah, you got wall. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I feel in a like, hockey ring. Exactly, but the the coaching that I would have throughout my entire childhood. As an athlete, I felt really instilled the principles of how to be successful or how to achieve any vision in any part of life. Well, I'll give you a real, real uh, <clears throat> surprise. Sure. Um, sophomore in high school, I was in drama class. Yeah. I got hit in the head with a shot put at 62 feet. Wow. Who, the guy who hit me was that year the state champ, mm. and he was a sophomore as well. He was state champ three years in a row. Uh, I don't know what happened to him because he never said he was sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh! So I just ignored him. That's a that's a heavy ball in the head. A twelve pound shot, sixty feet coming down. Oh, I've got a dent in my skull. Oh my gosh! From you the shot, but, yeah. Oh my gosh! Holy cow! Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> but it didn't knock me out. Huh. And they could hear it on the junior high baseball field, which was about 300 yards away. Wow. Said it sounded like somebody broke a bat. No way. And so the coaches came and said, are you okay? I went, yeah, I'm fine. And they said, can you walk? I said, sure. I get up. They let go of me, and I fall face forward. Because what it had done, hit me on the right side, it had paralyzed no way. my right arm and my right leg. I, no, left, left side. Right. It had paralyzed the left side. And I fell on a wooden stake that marked 60 feet with my nose. <laughs> oh and when they picked me back up again, the blood didn't come out of my nose. It ran down in my stomach. Oh, my gosh. So when we're going in the ambulance on the way... I threw up all this blood, and the ambulance guy freaking out. I've never seen my mother freak out. My mother was always calm. It's like in a crisis, in a major crisis, I'm always, I go really calm. And uh, I've been in planes where landing gears didn't come down. Everybody's freaking out, calling their ex-wives, telling everybody this. I'm going, stop it. <laughs> it's not. It's the front landing gear. Best, most is going to happen to you. You're going to break your arm, your leg. No big deal. <laughs> You're not dying. Right. I always go up to the pilot, because it's usually in private planes. Yes. I go up to the pilot. I go, wow. you know what you're doing here? And they go, yeah. I said, okay, okay. tell me. And they go, okay. 
I'm just going to make sure. Because I was in a plane. One woman was a pilot. She was freaking out. Mm -hmm. The co-pilot was going through the handbook like this. I'm going, what are you doing? Right. I said, have you tried to crank it down? And he went, oh, right. I'm going, oh, my God. <laughs> it's like that guy who wrote it's a circus song. Sure. So You're doing your research, essentially. Yeah, you're, I know you're about You're asking planes. questions. You're researching. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I go, so we're both trying to crank it down. And we're going by the tower, and we're asking him, the pilot's asking him, is it down? And they said, we can see it, but it's not down. So we're coming past it, and we have to circle in the airport about two hours. Mm. And about 50 feet before we hit the ground, it popped down. Whoa. Oh, I was ready. Sure. I had the pilot ready. Keep that nose up as long as you can. Yes. And these guys at this airport outside of London had foamed the runway, mm. put up a net to catch us. You're fine. You're gonna, yeah. I said, we're fine. Bump on the head or something. Or yeah. You bump your head, get a cut, no you're, big deal. Right. You're not dying, dude. Don't worry about it. Well, what makes you so calm in all these situations? Don't know. <laughs> but whenever there's a major crisis, I just suddenly become like, like still water. Hmm. And I can, okay, just relax. You're okay, you're okay. Mm. It's like on stage, if something, you know, if the PA goes out, if, if mm. something starts to happen, I just go really calm, and I go up and deal with the audience, and I'm really loud, right. and so I can <laughs> yell at them. I can yell, sure. even if it's an arena, they can hear me. Right, right, right. And if they can't, I'll go find something to make a megaphone out of. Wow. And so you just have that instinct that you just you yeah. got it handled. You got it under yeah. control. Amazing. Yeah. Do you feel like one of your parents maybe instilled that into you, or what was? Uh, it's probably my mother. Yeah, yeah. Cause she was that way. Yeah. Who I don't. I don't remember my mother very well. She died when she was young, hmm. when I was young. Yeah. Uh, my they both died when they were fifty. They my mother was older than my father, but they both died at fifty four. Hmm. How old were you when your father passed? Uh, 21. Okay. Wow. Is it and it was four years before that, so I was 17, I guess, when mother died. Wow. I don't remember. It's like I can't. Hmm. I mean, I can remember her, but I can't. I can't see her. I can't ever see her doing anything. Hmm. But you have photos or... Oh, yeah, I got yeah. a lot of photos. I just can't remember the memory of her doing something. Yeah, the only thing I remember is that the last time I saw her, we had a huge argument. Oh, man. Do you regret that? or? Yeah, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to her if you uh, could? If you had another moment to... Uh, I, I wouldn't have to say anything. She, she forgave me. Oh, she did? Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, I mean, that's I know that. That's cool. I, I know she would have... Yeah, that's who she was. Of course, all parents probably do, right? They yeah. Do it whenever we're crazy kids, right? Yeah. <laughs> wow. What was the biggest lesson you 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 learned from your dad? I think it's how to act because he was an alcoholic, mm. and he used to be like Jack Lemon in Days of Wine and Roses, and disappear for days upon time, and between Fort Worth and Dallas. When I was growing up, uh, along the Trinity River, which runs, this for Arlington was there. There was nothing there. It was like wilderness between Dallas and Fort Worth. Sure. Except for all this line of redneck bars. Mm. And that's where my dad would be. And so my mother would go looking for him. And when I got to be 12 or 13... Well, in the fifth grade, I weighed 185 pounds. Hmm. In the seventh grade, I weighed 240, which is, I weigh less today than I did in the seventh grade. <laughs> wow. And there's not too many people can say that. Sure. This morning, I weighed five pounds less than I did wow. in the seventh grade. Wow. So That's uh, a big seventh grader. <laughs> oh, man. I, I scored 77 points. They had a play, a button hook 
play. Uh-huh. Where I became the offensive end, they backed off the uh, the uh, end. Uh-huh. I went at about five step button hook. I had great hands. Sure. And they threw me the ball, and I would just run. And these little run kids, would over. To, these little kids would jump on me, try to tackle me. Wow. Even if they tried to tackle me low, I wouldn't fall down. Amazing. And I scored seventy-seven points, and it was an elementary record in Dallas. I don't know if it still is. Congrats, congrats but that was, about that. That was years ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that sure, was sure. like fifty years ago. <laughs> so I, somebody's probably passed it by now. Amazing. But um, so when I became twelve and thirteen, mm-hmm. I would tell my mother to wait in the car. I would go in. And I would walk into these bars, and I knew every one of them had a gun. Every guy in there had a gun. Because that it's was Texas. Texas, right? Yeah, of course. Oh, in the high school parking lot. And there were guys with pickup trucks with shotguns in racks in their back window. Right. So guns were everywhere. They are now. I mean, I live in Austin. Mm-hmm. They just love get, Austin. They just got a permit, though, to carry on campus at the University of no Texas. No way. Yeah. And it's because of all the, like, Virginia Tech and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And they might run into a few problems, but it's to deter people like the guy at Virginia Tech sure. from coming into the University of Texas doing that because he's going... Wait a second. Everyone's got a gun. I'm, These yeah. guys are carrying. I'm not going to do that. And you can carry in your car. Crazy. And and because everybody else does, I have one in my car. Sure, sure. I'm a little five shot thirty eight. Right. Because I'm not going to let some guy pull a gun on me. Sure. Is that pull a gun on me? I'm going to pull a gun on them. You sure. want to play? You want to play? You want to play? Let's play, son. You don't know who the hell you're dealing with here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a mean mother. I'll put. I'll get into the acting thing. Right. You scare someone quick. So when I go in there in those bars, it would all get quiet, and they would look at me, and I look back at them like, "You lay a finger on me, you're dead." Hmm. And so I think that's where I learned how to act. Amazing. And so that's why I like bad guys in movies so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's been the favorite your favorite character so far in a movie? Well, it's a played? movie written by Arthur Miller, and he was actually on the set and freaked me out. Mm. And it was with Bill Mason and Laura Dern. It's called Focus. And when did this come out? Oh, God, I don't know. 2000 maybe okay, okay. it was at the Toronto Film Festival gotcha and uh, so um, Arthur Miller I'm sitting at Video Village is where they have for people who don't know where the director would sit with his little TV monitors mm-hmm. and watch what the camera sees right and it's there's lines on it to show him what the actual film will turn out to be. Mm-hmm. So he can judge if he likes the scene, not from watching it live, from watching it on on the TV monitor. So they call it Video Village. So it's probably 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm sitting in my little chair in Video Village. And a guy comes to sit next to me, and I didn't, I didn't pay any attention. Right. And eventually I looked over and I went, oh, my God, it's Arthur Miller. (laughs) So I pick my chair up and I move it down the block and hide behind a tree. (laughs) And the first AD goes, what happened to Meatloaf? I know he was here. And I go, I'm I'm here. And so I've got got a a scene that really is shooting for two days with Bill Macy. Mm -hmm. And I go to Bill and I go, do you know Arthur Miller's on the set? And he goes, yeah. And I go, I'm freaked. <laughs> and Bill goes, me. See, I didn't do very well handling that one. <laughs> but he goes, he was, he goes, calm down. We know what we're doing. 
You know what you're doing? You've already shot a lot of this character. You got it. Don't worry about it. And okay. So I immediately calmed down. And we shot it. And at lunch, Bill and I always sat together at lunch. And Arthur Miller passed by me, put his hand on my shoulder, leaned over and said, I really like what you do with my character. I almost <laughs> fell into the spaghetti. <laughs> He sure, was like, sure. don't knock that over. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, yeah. I panicked then. You're good, you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, um, but, um, That's great. When he said, I really like what you do with my character. Because mm. I know he didn't have that in mind for his character when he wrote him. Yeah, wow. I know that. But I would have never asked him what he had in mind. Sure, sure. Because... I want him to be what I want him to be, not what Arthur Miller had in mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to get close. Arthur Miller characters are very complicated, especially one like I was playing, mm. who appears not stupid, but not really very smart, not real smart. Yeah. But all of Arthur Miller's characters are really very intelligent. They just don't know they are. So you have to play both sides. Mm. You have to play the guy who's not very smart, yet he's still intelligent, yeah. very intelligent. So you have to combine that. It's really complicated. I can imagine. <laughs> it's very complicated to that, work that work those two together. That's why you're one of the best. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, uh, you do a great job. I, I'm pretty good at what I do. You do a great do. job, yeah. Brando is my Brando, Hackman, uh, Orson Welles, Jimmy Stewart, Hal Holbrook, Jack Lemmon, um, a few modern-day, uh, um, uh, uh, the Irish guy. Oh, man. Um Colin Farrell, mm -hmm. Denzel Washington. Yeah. Um, they're really... I, I, I'm going to include Brad Pitt because mm -hmm. Brad Pitt is one of the most underrated actors out there. Yeah, well, you, you got to remember. With him. Yeah. yeah, you got to remember how long it took for Robert Redford or... Um, or uh, uh, oh, he was in Shampoo. Hmm. Um. Anyway, <laughs> someone, <laughs> Clint Eastwood. Yes, they had to get older to receive the recognition hmm. they should have gotten when they were younger. Mm -hmm. So Brad Pitt hadn't got his recognition, but he will. Yeah, he yeah. will. Yeah, I mean, as a, as as a really good actor. What was that like working with him? Oh, Brad Pitt is as down to earth as any human being. Mm. You just trust me. You wouldn't want to be Brad Pitt. Why? Oh, it, it, it's a job walking down on the street. It's a full time job, yeah. Yeah, it's a full time gig. I mean, it's hard enough for me to go to the grocery store. I, I can't even imagine Brad Pitt trying to go to the <laughs> grocery store. Right. I mean, I go to the grocery store, everybody wants to talk to me. Mm hmm. So I talk to them. So I try to avoid the grocery store as much as I can. <laughs> if I'm if I'm got my mindset, okay, I'm ready to go to the grocery store. I know there's a possibility. Some days I go in and nobody talks to me. Other days I go in and everybody wants to talk to me. Yeah. So you have to have your mindset when you go out. I'm going out. People may want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. What is it about him that continues to make him evolve? Like, why do you think he's able to evolve from just the model guy back in the day who's actually become a great actor and still... Uh, I think it's discipline, and yeah. I think it's that he studies his craft. Yeah. I mean, you have to... Con believe me, uh, Jack Lemmon still studies his craft. Eastwood definitely studies. Hmm. Uh, I really dislike actors 
who were very good when they were young, but they've stopped trying to learn. I won't name them Mm -hmm. because I'm not going to go that far. But I know who they are, and they know who they are. Sure. One of them has come out of it, and I was really glad to see it. Mm. Uh, but really extraordinary when they were young. Yeah, yeah. Brando was always extraordinary. Sure, sure. Um, a few questions left for you. I want to respect your time. Okay. Um, what are you most grateful for in your life recently? Oh, this record. Yeah. Bar none. Um, why know, is it, and why is this so meaningful for you? Because I think this is the best record I've ever done. Mm. And Jim Steinman, if you go on Meat Law Facebook, and it's it, it kept moving, and I kept pinning it to the top, so finally they realized that I wanted it pinned at the top. Right. So it's permanently pinned. Mm. Uh, he calls it one of the 10 best records ever made. Wow. Now, I'm not going to go that far, but (laughs) he can say that. Sure. But I really think it's the best record ever made because some people were expecting, like I said, bad or bad too. Mm -hmm. They go, oh, well, this is terrible. Mm Mm-hmm. And like I said, my doctor's prescription. Let's do it four times. In one day. Yeah. Well, you can do two days. That's okay. Okay. (laughs) Uh, But some people get it on the first listen. Yeah, sure. But they're expecting meatloaf to, you know, Mm -hmm. come in like a freight train. Right, right. And I don't. I'm going all the way to start. I'm in my low voice. But it's the same voice as Bad Out of Hell. Sure, sure. Just the timber's different because I'm 40 years older. Yeah, yeah. Exact same voice. Mm. If we had Bad Out of Hell, if I could compare them and show you, you'd hear it. Right. It's just as plain as you know a fried egg when you see one. <laughs> sure, sure. I love it. Um, something to be grateful for. What is something you, you've accomplished so much? You've got... One of the biggest albums of all time. You've now, done so I, many I don't. I pay no attention sure. to anything in the past. Mm. Nothing. Not even the four-star review from Q Magazine. Sure, sure. That's gone. What What's happening now is I'm talking to you. Yeah. And you're talking to Meatloaf. Yeah. This is this is this is Meatloaf in character, but the object of acting. And being in character is always about the truth of the moment. And I don't feel a song. I become the song. Hmm. I know two or three people like that. I know actors like that. But musicians, I can name three. I can name four, Joplin being one. But the others are guitar players. Brian May doesn't play guitar. He is the guitar. Mm. Scott Ian from Anthrax doesn't play the guitar. He is the guitar. But the number one is Jeff Beck. And Jeff Beck, Clapton's not far behind him. But Jeff Beck, you ever see Jeff Beck go? I saw him at the Les Paul, Mm. at Les Paul. Paul's Club, sitting this close to him. Uh, It was like he was the guitar. Amazing. He, He didn't play it. He was it. And so that's when I do a record... And people have said, oh, you can't possibly feel the music unless you've written it. And I always go, yeah, tell that to Marlon Brando about Streetcar Named Desire or On the Waterfront. Hmm. Or go tell that to, you know, Hoffman when he did Death of a Salesman. Or, you know, The Crucible, any actor that's ever done The Crucible. Hmm. Any of the great writers, Tennessee Williams, Shakespeare, right, right. Arthur Miller. I mean, going down the line, I can't. 
there's so many great writers sure, that have sure. written so many great plays. Um, but when I finish a song, it doesn't feel like Jim Steinman wrote it. Right. It feels like I wrote it. Because you become it. I, I am the song. Mm-hmm. I become that person. I become that song. And that's the thing that I disagree with on television. When they give them the advice, you've got to feel the song. If I was ever a mentor on one of those shows, I would tell the contestant, he's right, you must feel the song. But the first thing is, you have to become the song. You have to take it internally and become that moment of the song. And you don't control the stage, you control the room. You own it, you own every space. It's like Mm -hmm. my advice to an actor, a young actor who's going to auditions. I'm gonna look at the camera and say this. Go for it. When you go to an audition, it is your time, it is your moment, it is your room, and don't let anybody control you. Mm, I love it. You got me the chills. Yeah, <laughs> you don't. You could coach me all day. <laughs> you don't. You don't. You sure. don't let that. You know, <clears throat> casting agent. You don't even let the director mm. control you on your first reading. If after the first reading, the director says, "Are you able to do it this way?" You go, of course, just give me a second. And I will always like then rethink it and reanalyze it and be able to turn around and give him exactly what he wants. I mean, I've always said, if you want me to be an Irish milkmaid, I can be one. Oh, really? Yeah. (laughs) Let's see. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) It'd take me a little while to get there. (laughs) Sure, sure, sure. And then I have to get the Irish accent down. (laughs) Right, right. And we need a cow. (laughs) <laughs> well, we don't really need a cow. We just pretend there's a cow. Exactly. Um, this is a question I ask all my guests at the end. It's called the three truths question. So uh, uh, Everything is the truth. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, this is a question about uh, if you had, a, say it's a many years from now and it's the last day for you on earth. And uh, all your your movies, your albums, your work that you put out there, is, for whatever reason, it's been erased. So people don't have the content you put out there. But you have a piece of pen, or you have a piece of paper and a pen to write down three things you know to be true about your entire experience in life. All the acting, the music, the relationships, the touring, everything you've ever learned. Oh, it would be about none of that. Okay. What would be your your three truths, the thing that you would share to the world that would be kind of the lessons that you would give back? About my wife, my grandson, and my daughters. Okay. Yeah, about my wife, Deborah. Uh-huh. My grandson, Rebel, who by then could be one of the most famous musicians on the face of the earth. Wow. He's like a child prodigy. I can't, I mean, it flabbergasts me. Um, and about my daughter, Sperl and Amanda, mm-hmm. and how talented they are and how they should continue to follow their paths mm. and their truths and their dreams. Sure. And there is a line. People always go, why do you think the Rocky Horror Show is, has lived so long? I said, there's a line in the Rocky Horror Show that people may not know consciously, but subconsciously they hear it. And the line is, don't dream it be it Mm. Mm. that's a good truth right there i like that (laughs) well before i ask the final question okay meet i want to acknowledge you for a moment for your incredible humility your incredible talent your incredible drive your work ethic and your ability to inspire and lift so many people up on all the work that you do it's so I, i i try to i i try i think the whole world should do this um People forget 
about manners. I introduce myself to everybody. Hmm. I, I don't care if they know who I am or not. Hi, I'm me. What's your name? You know, I will always say thank you. Even to Frances, who's been working with me for eight years. She does something for me. I say thank you. Whatever it is, I say thank you. Because it means a lot to me. Mm. Say thank you. You're welcome. Be kind. I get on a plane. I ask the flight attendants, how's your day? Mm -hmm. Well, it's been pretty good. Well, I hope it gets better. And I hope that everybody treats you with the respect you deserve. And they go, whoa. <laughs> I, and I do that everywhere I go. Yeah. Because I think that's important that all people deserve the respect and the gratitude for for being who they are Absolutely. and what they do. Absolutely, yeah. And I will always try to help because I was homeless in my life. Mm. So I know what that's like. Sure. I, I've had a lot of experiences in my life so I can relate to almost every one. My band, when I was on Motown, was all African American. Mm. And we went through the South. And they literally, the racism I saw, they were the ones holding me back. <laughs> I was ready to attack. And they were going, me, it's okay. We go through this all the time. I go, I don't really care. This guy's not going to treat you that way. Wow. Me, come on. Come on, let's go. Let's go. I mean, I even went into the kitchen in the Holiday Inn and and got water and bread and butter and everybody brought it to the table, got everybody's order, took it into the kitchen myself, handed it to the chef. And I said, you want me to come back and get it? No, we'll bring it. <laughs> wow. And I mean, I, I, my mother taught me that. My, my grandfather was that way. My yeah. mother taught me that. Yeah. And that, and, Oh, I would get so angry when I was in high school at at that because I grew up in Texas. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a there's a bit of racism. It, it's gotten better. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one night we were going home, and we were right by Love Field, and we were in Lovers Lane, and a group of African Americans came and started hitting my car with baseball bats and the windshield and the and I got out of the car. And my friend's going, Don't get out of the car. I said, Yeah, I'm getting out of the car. Mm. And I was very calm and they all of a sudden just stopped. And I said, I understand why you're doing this, but You need to learn respect because I am respect for you. Mm. Even though you just done what you did to my car, my car is nothing but a piece of metal. Right. It doesn't mean anything compared to you. You are worth so much more than this piece of metal. Wow. And they just kind of looked at me and, and walked away. My friend thought they were going to just kill me. And I said, no. Wow. And it was like one of those moments. I got out perfectly calm and just didn't yell at them, talked to them in this kind of voice. And they all kind of stopped. And, and I talked to them. That's what I said. And I, I think I was like possessed by my grandfather. Because <laughs> that's the kind of words my grandfather would have used. Sure, sure. Amazing. Well, I appreciate the example you've been setting for many years for how to treat people and how to be Well, I, I mean, I think the world is, is 
is upside down at the moment. And right. we really need more love in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And we need more respect for each other. Absolutely. For everyone. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, I want to ask one final question. Okay. Uh, make sure everyone go pick up Braver Than We Are. Meet Love, the legend who doesn't like to be called a legend. Yeah, I don't like to be called a legend. Get this. It's on iTunes. But it, 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 it is. Uh, you got to listen to it to understand Four it. times, people. Four times. Don't <laughs> disregard it on your first listen there you because go. it's better than you think it is. I like it. I like it. Final question. What's your definition of greatness? People that respect other people. There you go. Meet. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, then make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can do that by clicking right here to subscribe because each week we come out with awesome, epic, and inspiring interviews and messages and videos just for you. So click subscribe right here to get notified of new videos every week. Also, if you enjoyed this specific interview, we've got a lot of great interviews like this that are uplifting and inspiring. So click right here to watch the previous interviews because the people I've had on are pretty cool and epic as well. So click here to watch previous interviews. Click here to subscribe. I love you guys, and I'll see you very soon.